Hi friends, my name is Dr. Gwen, and I'm a clinical psychologist who's obsessed with empowering disabled individuals, their families, and the systems that support them. I had the pleasure of interviewing Justine Muffson, a speech and language pathologist. She breaks down the many pressure points at speech therapist ease, how her job is all about fostering connection and understanding, and how she's passionate about giving all kids a voice in any shape or form. She's another creative in this professional space, and we are so lucky to have her. Timestamps are in the description below. Please enjoy this interview with Justine. Hi, Justine, how are you? I'm doing great now that I see your face. How are you? <laughs> Good. Thanks, Justine. You always make me smile. Thanks so much for, for coming on to the video and for us to do some deeper dives into what a speech and language therapist does. But maybe what we can do is start with who are you? Tell us about yourself. Absolutely. And I'm honored to be here. Oh, so this thanks, is awesome Justine. for me. You're so sweet. Um, so me, I, at a very young age, absolutely loved working with kids. I, not even working, just being around kids. Um, and I think everyone who knew me knew that about me. So I always was very passionate about that. I knew I wanted to work with kids in some sort of element um, initially I thought maybe I'll be a pediatrician, maybe I'll go to med school. And I started that track in undergrad. Um, but I quickly realized, you know, I don't need to go through all of the bio and chem and all that crazy <laughs> intense stuff to yeah. be a professional that works in the, with the pediatric population. So after I graduated with a psychology degree um, in my undergrad education, uh, the opportunity to be a behavioral therapist kind of fell into my lap. My mom had a friend who's, who, who has a daughter with autism and she was looking for a behavioral aid to be with her in the school setting. And she knew that I love working with kids. I had never worked with a special needs population prior to that. So that was a little daunting for me, but I said, sure, I'm interested. I would love to meet your daughter. Went to go meet her. Absolutely fell in love with this girl. She is beautiful. She is so cute. I used to um, call her the autistic version of myself. <laughs> She, <laughs> she's quirky, but she loves music. She loves singing. She loves hugs. She loves pressure. I, all things that I'm super passionate about myself. Um, so it, it, this whole thing kind of started with me clicking with this particular soul, this particular mm -hmm. individual and really tuning into how she communicates, tuning into what her needs were, what her sensory needs were. And this was all stuff that I really didn't have any information or education about. It's, I kind of just like was thrown in and learned on the spot. And I was very lucky that I was surrounded by other professionals that had a lot more experience than I did. And they were kind enough to show me and teach me and I was just a sponge. I, I took it all in and that experience actually led me to my next job as an infant stimulation therapist. So the those other professionals that helped me kind of get me on my feet, they um, saw that I had a knack and passion for this and asked if I would be interested in working in a center-based program doing early intervention. Mm -hmm. So that led me down that path. And that was super fun for me, working with toddlers and just kids three, three years and under. And working with parents was a whole new um, thing for me as well. Um, when you work with kids that young, you really have to... Um, tune into the parents and their needs and their um, emotions. And a lot of the time, they're first time parents. And yeah. it can be really scary. You don't know what you're doing. Um, and you're just worried that your child might not be meeting the milestones that they should meet, be meeting. So that put me in a really nice position to learn um, how to coach parents and how to get them to trust me, how to 
really empower them to engage and interact with their children in order to like set them up with those building blocks to have language and communication. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was really in that setting that I decided, oh, maybe, maybe speech, maybe that's something that I would want to do. So after being in that area for about three years, I applied to go to graduate school and I moved to Washington, D.C. I went to the George Washington University, which I absolutely loved. Um, And again, I entered graduate school thinking pediatrics, going to do this, definitely want to work with kids. Um, But it really opened up my eyes to how broad the speech pathology profession yes. is there are so many and we'll i'm sure we'll get into this later but it just opened up my eyes to how many things you can do with this profession and i ended up actually falling in love with working with adults as well i had the opportunity to um work at gw hospitals outpatient rehab clinic so while i was there i worked with a lot of head and neck cancer patients. So doing a lot of work with dysphagia and swallowing and a lot of vocal rehab as well. Um, Having them, setting them up with different techniques and strategies to um, use their voice again. And Mm. I love that. And that kind of coincided with my love of music and voice as well. So that was really fun for me. Um, And we also did a lot of like cognitive linguistic work as well. So working with adults with traumatic brain injuries or stroke patients, um, working on their memory, executive functioning skills, social communication. And I was very surprised how much I enjoyed that. Um, And to the point where I left graduate school thinking maybe I'm going to switch to adults. That didn't end up happening and I'm totally fine with it. I'm, I'm happy where I am. Um, but yeah, after graduate school, I came back to Los Angeles and I started working at the Napa center and Napa stands for neurological and physical habilitation center. Um, and it's a wonderful, wonderful place. They're located in, Hawthorne, El Segundo area in Southern California. And this place is wonderful in how it's so inclusive of all abilities. You see children and young adults, even some adult patients that come in of all different backgrounds, all different abilities, all different religions, races, ethnicities, you see everything here. Um, We have people traveling in from all over the world, which is pretty awesome. Um, And it really opened up my world to a more medically complex communication. So in this setting, I had the opportunity to work with a lot of children who have brain-based disorders. So cerebral palsy, epilepsy, uh, seizure disorders, um, genetic disorders. Uh, We also have a lot of kids who have autism and um, just you, you get the whole gamut Mm -hmm. at the Napa Center. And it really allowed me to grow as a clinician and learn all the, I, I feel like, as I mentioned before, speech pathology is so broad. I had to kind of tap into all of like the micro, um, uh, jobs or micro professions in the speech pathology field to set up all of these kiddos with success. Um, So I had the opportunity to um, get into the augmentative and alternative communication world, um, getting into um, feeding and swallowing for kids, which I hadn't done prior to working at Napa Center. It was mostly adults that I did that with. it's been awesome. And I also see um, some private clients on the side too, which is really fun. And it's, it's been a really fun ride and I'm excited to continue growing and learning. And it's something that I'll be doing for the rest of my life as I'm sure you will be too. 
Yeah, that kind of winded answer to your question. No, I love it. I mean, I think the background is, <laughs> it's so interesting because so many of the professionals that I've interviewed have a music background. Really? Yeah. And it's, huh. it's so fascinating to me. We might have to just get all of your, all, all, everyone that I've interviewed will get like with a music background together. And we should talk about yes. this because I think that there's this inherent creativity in expression and the way you understand things. Anyway, it's, it's fascinating to me, but already for, anyway, side conversation. Um, what's so cool is all of this kind of lateral movement that you can make as a speech and language therapist, right? I think yes. about that a lot in psychology. In psychology, there are so many different facets because human beings are so complex that there's so much movement and it really itches that, or yeah, it itches that, um, itch that I have where I'm always trying to learn something new or stay curious or, you know, evolve in some way, shape totally. or form. So it really allows for that. You've got this really lovely experience um, with so many different types of complex presentations, you know, um, and, and, but they all have a similarity to them, which is how do I communicate? How do I use my mm -hmm. voice in the world? Maybe mm -hmm. is another way to say And what does, what is that definition of voice? Yeah. Right? Yeah. What does that mean? Because um, it can look so different for everybody. I think mm -hmm. when people think about communication, it, people automatically think of the typical way of communicating, which is verbal speech, but that's not the case. I mean, people communicate with sign, people communicate with picture systems, they communicate with high tech systems, with eye gaze, with, it, there's, it's so broad. Yeah. And um, I'm actually, I'm really excited that we're doing this so I can bring a little bit more attention to all the different forms of communication that are out there and kind of bringing more of a focus and hopefully reducing the stigma around other types of communication that don't fall into that verbal category, Abs right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and that's what, you know, this, the, the Napa Center is giving you such, an, um, such a diverse exposure to all the different types of communication. I mean, you brought up right. augmentative communication, alternative communications, right? Um, picture mm -hmm. communication, like, there's so, that in and of itself is a huge, specialty. Um, yeah. it's, it's uber creative. And I just feel like this is like where, this is where all these artists are coming from, you know, are these artists that are <laughs> now in some kind of, you know, professional um, capacity and in, in this field of disabilities, special needs, you know, um, so it's, it's super cool. You know, Justine, let's get into kind of the more traditional maybe definition or idea of what a speech and language therapist does. Absolutely. So a speech and language therapist or a speech and language pathologist, same thing, two different words to describe it. Um, when you hear pathologist, that just means that um, a part of our job is to evaluate and figure out where the root of the problem is coming from, Right. So just like um, a pathologist in the medical field, you want to know what sort of infection or disease or um, is going on in a person's body. The same thing with speech and language or communication, rather. I need to kind of dissect and figure out why is this child or why is this adult presenting with these communication difficulties and what can I do to help support that person? Mm -hmm. um, so a speech therapist, we work to assess, diagnose, and treat speech, language, social communication, cognitive communications, and swallowing disorders in children and adults. Um, and honestly, it goes even beyond that. And we can get into that even mm -hmm. more if you would like. Um, we work with people of all ages, the, all the way from infancy to adults. Um, so it, 
we, we treat um, speech sound disorders. So that's how we say sounds and put sounds together in words. Um, so that's like your articulation or phonological disorders. Um, we also treat language. So that's how well we understand what we hear or read and how we use our words to tell others what we're thinking or feeling. Um, and then we go into literacy. So mm -hmm. how well we read and write. Um, we have that social aspect, the social communication, how well we follow the rules of a community, those hidden rules, um, like taking turns or how to talk to different people, how close to stand to someone when you're yeah. talking to them. Yes. Um, yes. And then another element is voice. So how your voice sounds and is it functional for communication in everyday life? Uh, we have fluency, so that's stuttering. How well does your speech flow? Um, we have cognitive communication. So that's how our mind works. How are we problem solving? How are we organizing our thoughts and our thinking skills? Um, there's also oral rehabilitation. So that's if you have um, a hearing disability. So kind of teaching you or setting you up with strategies to be able to uh, communicate and get all the information, auditory information or visual information to be able to communicate. And lastly, we have feeding and swallowing. So, and I think this one is something that gets overlooked quite a bit um, in our field. Uh, it is in our scope of practice as a speech language pathologist to um, look at how well um, we are manipulating foods and taking it down, um, how well we suck, chew, and swallow food. Um, that's also a part of what we do. So there's a lot. There's a ton, a ton, a ton. And if you feel like you need a career change, you can still have that title of speech language pathologist, but still really change what you're doing, um, which is cool. It keeps you on your toes for sure. It gives you a lot of variety. Um, but yeah, that's the huge array of things that a speech therapist does or can do. I think that's awesome that you reviewed all those because traditionally, I think people automatically go to articulation, right? right. Um, mm -hmm. how do, how do I sound? How am I pronouncing words? And, um, you know, having a voice and communicating is so much greater than just that. It's a very mm -hmm. complex system, actually. And so yeah. it's a system that is in and of itself one that also has to use like eyes and ears. Right. right. And so yeah. even those two systems are so complex individually, yeah. right? So yeah. the idea of getting to the heart of how are you being understood, right? How do you advocate mm -hmm. for yourself? It's these things, especially mm -hmm. for me working exactly. with teens and adults. How do you have the language, develop your lexicons in order for you to advocate for yourself totally. as an adult? So yeah. this is like so fascinating. Justine, when do you feel a, someone needs a speech and language pathologist or therapist? Like what is that kind of point in which someone goes, you know, this, a speech and language pathologist or therapist would be really helpful here? Right. So um, I think the best way to kind of go through this is to kind of go through those different um, elements of what we do sure. as speech pathologists. And mm -hmm. I can kind of go through some signs in those um, different areas of what you might hear, what you might see, um, what you might be experiencing um, and how that might lead you to uh, getting assessed by a speech language pathologists and seeing if you actually do need skilled um, therapy. Uh, so if I go back to um, the traditional area of speech therapy that most people think of, articulation. Um, so this is when you might have trouble. Um, this is when you might have trouble saying sounds or putting sounds together to create a word, right? So some signs might include substituting one sound for another. So for example, saying wabbit instead of rabbit, leaving sounds out of words, saying winnow instead of window, or changing the, how sounds are made. That's kind of a distortion. Mm -hmm. um, another thing 
also with speech sounds, it might also be a motor issue. So there might be a disconnect between your brain and your articulators, meaning your, your lips, your tongue, your cheeks, your teeth. There might be a disconnect and the message of telling your articulators where to go to create that sound might be getting lost in translation. Mm -hmm. And that's when you have that issue, it's typically called apraxia of speech or childhood apraxia of speech. Um, so with that diagnosis, we, we typically have to wait until a child does have some words to be able to give the diagnosis. Um, and there are specific signs for apraxia of speech. Um, but typically there's, if you see a child that's groping, they're kind of getting stuck on a word that's a sign of apraxia of speech. Another sign is if they're making different speech sound errors on the same word. So for, mm. it's, for example, if they're saying, they're trying to say dog, they might say dop, dob, bob. So every different production sounds different, mm. right? Um, and then another um, motor, speech disorder is dysarthria. So this might be, this means when there's a weakness of the articulators. So your speech might sound a little bit slushy or slow. Um, so we might work on um, kind of strengthening your articulators and providing you with compensatory strategies to be better understood. Mm -hmm. So that's speech sounds. Language. So some signs that you might be having difficulty with language is if you're having Difficulty understanding what others are saying. So following directions, for example, problems um, expressing your thoughts. So you might have a decreased vocabulary or um, you might be communicating in one to two words instead of full length sentences, um, having trouble thinking of the right words to use and potentially problems with reading and writing as well. Mm. So if you might, if you see that you're having trouble communicating your wants, needs, thoughts, feelings, or you're having trouble understanding other people, or you're having trouble um, reading and writing that would be seen in the school setting typically, mm -hmm. um, you might look into getting an assessment for speech and language therapy. Um, with social communication, um, you might have trouble knowing how to speak to other people. Um, you might be interrupting or standing too close <laughs> to others when speaking, just like knowing those hidden social rules. Yeah. Um, you might use language that's not right for the listener in the situation, such as speaking to an adult versus a child, using slang during a job interview, that sort of thing. If you're having trouble with that, you might look into um, getting speech therapy. Um, in terms of voice, if the quality of your voice sounds hoarse or breathy, or there's a nasal sound to it, or if you're speaking, speaking with a pitch that's too high or too low, mm -hmm. or if you're easily losing your voice, these are signs that you might, first of all, you might need a consult with an ear, nose, and throat doctor to actually see if there's something structurally wrong with your voice box. And then after you go and do that, then you can get referred to a speech therapist for the, the therapy and the rehabilitation process. And then going into fluency or stuttering, you might be experiencing or observing. Um, uh oh, do you hear that, Gwen? Did you nope. hear that? Oh, nope. sorry. That's okay. Go okay. ahead. Keep that going. was an oopsie. It was a phone. That's okay. Okay. So I'll go back to stuttering. Yeah. With stuttering, uh, you might um, hear or observe repeating sounds at the beginning of words. So, so for example, b -b 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 ball or pausing while talking. So, or stretching a sound out, saying snake instead of snake mm -hmm. or saying um or uh a lot while talking. Mm -hmm. uh, with cognitive communication, this is problems problem solving or problems with memory, if you're forgetting a lot or um, you're having trouble um, problem solving social types of situations or thinking skills, you might want to consult as well. Um, and feeding and swallowing. If um, this can, this is also a huge range, can be all the way from birth 
you might um, have a infant with a tongue tie who can is having difficulty latching during breastfeeding. You might have a child who has sensory issues with food. They cannot stand the texture or the smell or of specific foods. You might help with that. Um, you m might actually have um, actual motor issues. So this goes hand in hand with speech. If you're having trouble coordinating your mm -hmm. um, muscles for feeding, you're going to need um, therapy to address that so that you can successfully chew and swallow safely. Um, and then the same thing with adults. A lot of the time we have adults who have had strokes or their cancer patients and through chemotherapy, the um, muscles and um, anatomy that's used for swallowing can be really affected. So setting them up with strengthening and compensatory strategies to have a safe swallow, that's a huge part about, of what we do as well. So amazing. <laughs> that was a, another long-winded answer, Gwen. Um, but it's, it's amazing. Yeah, so these are, yeah. It's, it's actually amazing, Justine. I mean, I think what's so helpful, even for me, being around speech therapists for the last two decades, right? I knew about mm -hmm. some of these, but I really didn't know about all of it. And so I think that's yeah. so great because there, I guess for me, what it, it provides is hope. Right. Right. Yeah. Like, oh, there's, oh, I'm struggling with this. Oh, there is someone that knows about that. You know, there's someone that, yeah. that, that, that they're an expert in that and they can help me with that, you know? And so mm -hmm. it's kind of like this idea of, you know, relieving a pressure point or addressing a pain point that people have, because I feel like those pain points are exactly what drive people to seek help. Right. Hopefully right. anyway. Right. So, you know, for you, what are your um, hopeful outcomes for someone who's coming in? Obviously there's a lot of different, there's a lot of different areas that someone would come in, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and meeting the needs that they have. But for you in general, what do you hope people get from speech and language therapy? Right. So I'm going to talk about this in the term, in terms of pedi the pediatric population. Um, I think a huge pain point for these families is just being able to know the needs um, of their child. So providing relief for parents and their kiddo that they're being understood and their needs are being met. Um, providing relief and decreasing frustration that a child is not being understood. Mm -hmm. So providing the support to elicit and maintain meaningful social interactions, uh, maintaining strong communication and building a relationship with your child through communication, whether that means verbal speech, signs, using alternative communication, um, doing voice therapy so they actually have a voice to use verbal speech, right? It can be, it, look, it can look different for everybody. But I think the huge takeaway here is being able to advocate for yourself, mm -hmm. being able to communicate your wants and needs, being able to have those meaningful interactions and connect with your friends and family. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and then also providing a healthy and safe relationship with food, um, providing you with the skills um, necessary to have a safe swallow and getting the adequate nutrition that a patient needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. so we see language or even the mouth as being a conduit for so many mm -hmm. things, right? Whether it's, um, I need to express what my needs and wants are. I need to ask for help, right? I need right. to be safe because I need to eat. I mean, in order to right. survive and, you know, right. so how important language is um, or this field is to so many pieces of our life. I love how you brought up how language and the social communication aspects really are important because having relationships with people is mm -hmm. a critical thing. It's the best. It's the best part of life. It's the best part about being here yeah. on this earth, 
having that connection and really bonding with someone. I mean, I don't know what I would do without that. And oftentimes I get families that come in and just they're defeated. Like I cannot connect with my child Mm. and it breaks my heart, but that's what I love to do. That's my favorite thing is kind of diving in and figuring out what's going on here and how can I set this child up with a communication system that best meets their needs and their family's needs and how can I coach the family into using this new communication system because essentially they're le- they're learning a new language mm-hmm. right because mm-hmm. the way that they were communicating and they know to communicate is not working for their child mm-hmm. so we have to kind of change the way we think about communication educate the parent and um, set them up for success in the home. Because a lot of the time I'm seeing patients one, maybe two times a week, that's not enough. We're not gonna see a ton of language acquisition and improvement just by seeing me for one to two hours a week. It really is a team effort and um, the parents and caregivers, friends, family, siblings, they all need to be on board and kind of Um, carry over everything that I'm working on in therapy and using it in the home, in the community, at school, right? Otherwise, we're not going to see, we're not going to get the biggest bang for our buck if otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think what's so awesome is this focus on practicality, right? Mm -hmm. Because you and I both know that what's the solution is skill building. There needs to be Mm -hmm. a different skill set here that's used in order to fill this gap, right? In order to make the connections, in order to be more understood, whatever that is, that our jobs as therapists, I see this myself as in myself as well, that more work happens in between the sessions than in the session, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's really just kind of me guiding you and giving you very practical things to practice um, or do or try or experiment with and be curious about. I mean, it's really that in between time though, where big movement's happening um, mm-hmm. versus me. I can kind of maybe give you the GPS routes to get there, different routes to get right. there, you know? So that yeah. that's great. And having worked with you on a team, and this is how you and I know each other, you have this real knack of getting to the heart of an issue and then implementing something <laughs> very quickly that the whole team can understand and implement. So I see that in you. Thank you. You know, um, and that's exactly what it is. Because I think sometimes people don't know what to expect out of therapy, Mm -hmm. right? It's not just, I bring my kid to you, you fix them and and we leave, right? Right. No. I'm just a part of this team. I'm a part of this process. This This happens to be my expertise. And I'm going to give you, I'm going to share my knowledge with you specific to this right. as just one mm-hmm. part, right? And so- Exactly. Good. Yeah. So it's what, pe- what people can really expect when they, they right. receive therapy is, oh, I'm part of this. I'm getting empowered through skills. Empowered is the best word to use here. Yeah, and not yeah. only the child, the yes. family. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. That's- yeah. As, as a parent myself, being disconnected from my, from my child, not understanding maybe what it is they need would be a very uncomfortable position for me to be in as a mother. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can really I can o- relate yeah. to that. <laughs> I can only imagine I'm not a mother yet. I hope uh-huh. to be someday, yes. but I, I see it, I feel it. And it's, like I said, it's heartbreaking when you don't have that connection or there's something that's holding you back, something that um, is creating this space um, Mm -hmm. and finding out how to move these two beings or three or four beings together towards each other. Mm -hmm. That's the magic. That's my passion. And I'm sure 
everybody and everyone that you've interviewed in these related fields, it's their job too within their wheelhouse. Yeah. For me specifically, it's communication and food or feeding. Um, but for you, it might be more, it's that psychological aspect, those um, emotions and what's really going on in the family system. What are those constructs that are, you know, going on and how can you help everyone connect better? Yeah. Yeah. Right? I'm always, I'm always fascinated with language because language serves as our, of, as the symbols to our mm -hmm. feelings and thoughts. So mm -hmm. if we have the language at our, you know, disposal to use, mm -hmm. that allows us to connect. It allows right. us to get help. It allows mm -hmm. us to feel understood. And, you know, just being with people who you felt seen by or understood yeah. with, right? Yeah. There is that sense of, um, uh, that's like the sweet spot of being a human yes. with other people, mm -hmm. right? And you know exactly mm -hmm. who those people are in your life that you don't really need to say much, but boy, do they get you. And it's very <laughs> yeah. easy to be with those people, you know? And so, you know, I see language as being that kind of symbolic um, archetype, if you will, lexicon that allows that to happen. And, mm -hmm. um, and we want that for everybody, you know, to be quite honest, we, we want everyone to have that, yeah. those experiences. Um, everyone deserves to have that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, can we dig into the social communication aspects just a little bit? Yes. It's, Definitely my bias because this is where I see a lot of my clients uh, skidding out, right? This is where the mm -hmm. rubber's being the road and I'm seeing smoke coming out of the tires, which is <laughs> you've got language, right. you know how to communicate, but mm -hmm. oh boy, we apply it to different dynamic social situations and mm -hmm. we have a little bit of a mess on our hands. Yes. So yes. talk to us about how a speech and language therapist might approach something, something like that. Right. So we're, we're digging into the social pragmatic area of language. And this starts as early as inf infancy. So making eye contact, finding your parents' face, um, smiling, having that joint attention where you know that you are referencing the same object or activity and having that shared enjoyment, right? This starts very early on. And I feel like a lot of the time, um, parents are just kids that grew up and had more kids, right? They don't, they, we, we aren't, a lot of us aren't kind of educated with these early developmental skills and milestones to look for and also to elicit in early childhood. Mm -hmm. So I think if we are seeing these red flags of my child isn't making eye contact, my child isn't, um, doesn't really enjoy playing with me or other children, they prefer playing by themselves. My child um, doesn't really find me in a room. They don't even know I'm there, right? So looking for these red flags and finding them early and getting in with early intervention is going to be huge in general. We can directly teach these skills very early on. And um, there are some wonderful programs out there. Um, I don't know, I'm sure you're familiar with these, Glenn, but Hannon, It Takes Two to Talk, mm -hmm. yeah. um, Hannon Morgan Words. So these are wonderful programs where me as a speech language pathologist, I am the coach and I am coaching the parents on how to interact with their children, right? Communication, social communication, those interactions, they're going to come from these meaningful pre-linguistic skills of connecting with one another. So having eye contact, having joint attention, 
before we can have words, whether they're it's verbal speech or signs or using a device, yeah. we need to have that interaction. We need to have that connection. That's the building block. Those are the building blocks to having words, whatever mm-hmm. those words look like. Mm-hmm. So first of all, trying to look for these milestones or these red flags, getting in early um, so that not only the child, but the parents can be empowered to get this social language out, right? Being, teaching them how to interact with others, setting them up early. That doesn't always happen and it's fine, totally okay. Sometimes we get kids or young adults much Mm -hmm. later who didn't necessarily um, learn these skills early on. There's still a ton we can do and help them be a little bit more successful in making these meaningful interactions and um, having social communication with others. So we um, might, we, we'll continue to work on eye contact and also, but if we, hopefully at this point, we have some more language where we are having conversations, right? So we really dig deep and do some direct teaching on like, what should a conversation look like? Yeah. What are the rules of a conversation? First of all, we need to greet someone, right? And when we greet someone, are we looking at the wall? Or are we looking at the person, right? Looking at the person shows that you're thinking about them and you have that theory of mind and you um, want to be speaking to them, right? Mm-hmm. Um, having that back and forth, knowing the rules of turn-taking, not dominating a conversation and not letting the other person doing all the talking. Um, and all of this comes through practice. Yeah. A lot of it comes through feedback visual feedback. I love to videotape a lot of the kids that I work with, play it back and have them kind of ruminate. Think about like, how did I come across in this social interaction? Was it appropriate? Like, was that an expected behavior? Was it unexpected? How did the other person feel about um, X, Y, or Z? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of this can be directly taught and it doesn't come naturally to everybody and that is okay. That's fine. But um, just, you might, if you are having difficulty with this, get in with a speech therapist that can dive deep with you and teach you these social skills to be more functionally um, able and communicative in life and being able to have these beautiful interactions with other people. Cause like we said, that's the magic in life. Um, I'm trying, there's probably so much more that I'm missing, but yeah. Yeah. You that's know, what came to mind. Yeah. And, and I think yeah. the message there too, Justine is it doesn't matter how old you are, right? No, it these doesn't. are skills. Like, there's, yeah. there's models and structures and programs that can help, you know, mm-hmm. and I've never worked in all of my years with a client who didn't want a friend. Right. You know? Yeah. Me neither. Uh, uh, or a girlfriend or a boyfriend, or, you know, whatever this right. is like by the time right. they come to see me and, you know, for me, they're 16 and over with most of my clients being in their twenties, they're desperate for some meaningful human connection with their Mm -hmm. peers, you know, and I like think a lot of times because they are so far out of early intervention by their Mm twenties that people are like, well, we're just going to throw our hands up and like, give you some, give you a, I don't know, give you something else to do, redirect you. And it's like, (laughs) oh my gosh, like there's so much more we can do, you know, and especially when they're motivated and bought into, to this, where Mm -hmm. you can say, this is what's really going to help you make a friendship, maintain a friendship, Mm -hmm. have a friendship for a long time, you know, these types of things. Yeah. You know what I love? Not even, yeah. Sorry. No, go, go, go. (laughs) I was going to say, I was going to say, not only that, but setting them up to be more, I think a lot of these social skills sets a young adult up to be independent, you know, and setting them up with those essential skills of going on a job interview. What, 
what do I have to do in order to be successful in a job interview? That eye contact's gonna be huge. Knowing your audience is gonna be huge, knowing not to use um, slang in an interview or knowing who you're talking to is gonna be instrumental in getting hired in a job. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, just so setting them up with those life skills, the, the communication aspect of life skills is huge. And I, I know that's a lot of what you work with, work with your kids with. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, to be an adult, we have to do a lot of speaking. We have to do a lot of listening. Mm -hmm. We have to do a lot of talking and communicate, hopefully communicating more than just talking. Um, you know, this idea of what came up to my mind was kind of shaping your self narrative, right? Mm -hmm. If we can feel more confident with expressing our needs and getting our needs met um, and connecting with people, that does have a feedback piece Mm -hmm. that shapes our self narrative, which I think is intimately tied to empowerment and advocacy and agency as a person. So, you know, the other piece too, is as a parent, if I can see and trust that my child, whether they're a kiddo or an adult kiddo for that matter, Mm -hmm. if I can trust that they can communicate what they need appropriately when they need it, Mm -hmm. that helps Mm -hmm. me pull back a little bit. Right. That helps me let go a little bit. It helps me trust that they're going to be okay. And so this is such, it's a critical skill. Language is critical as a skill. So I just love that we're playing. We're we're, we're, we're (laughs) playing. We're playing. Um, Justine, let's talk about really quick. We're going off the rails just a little bit, but I can't help myself. I love it. Some, some of the things that you're talking about promote introspection and self-reflection, mm-hmm. right? Because we right. have to have this kind of observer view of ourself in order to know who our audience is, how yeah. we look and should present ourselves in that moment, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, and you really talked about this through videotaping as a strategy mm-hmm. or as an intervention strategy, which yeah, I will say to you is incredibly insightful yes. for the populations that I work with because they don't realize it's not intentional. No. They just don't realize the way they, they look. Don't. Yeah. Another part of it too, like going beyond videotaping is having a communication partner on the other side who might be a therapist or is an individual that's kind of aware of the um, client's needs and where they're trying to grow. Mm-hmm. Um, and being able to paint the picture of what they're feeling and how the client is making them feel mm-hmm. in terms of their communication. I find that to be very powerful. Yeah. So me critiquing my clients is very different than the communication partner, partner critic, critiquing the client. When it comes from someone else who's actually experiencing the client's communication skills and their pragmatic skills or social skills, it becomes a lot more powerful, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Because they're not necessarily looked as this professional that's just trying to teach them all these things that they need to know, mm-hmm. right? Hopefully they're speaking to someone that hopefully the client is speaking to someone that they want to have a relationship with. So when they hear from that person, you know, it really kind of frustrated me when you were talking about iguanas for 10 minutes, you know what I mean? (laughs) Or whatever it is, you know, like, that's not what I want to talk about. Yeah. You know, or it, it made me feel like you didn't really want to talk to me when you had flat affect or you were monotone the whole conversation. Yeah. So hearing that from someone else other than me, other than a parent can be really insightful. Yeah. And powerful. Yeah. Yeah. It's like that, um, relational currency, you know, Mm -hmm. it's, it's the idea of how dynamic relationship building is and how communication 
plays a huge role in that, not only for individuals with disabilities, but for all of us, um, for that matter, mm -hmm. that, you know, when we can communicate with our families and our partners and, you know, effectively, we, we tend to see those relationships deepen and then they're more robust or rich mm -hmm. um, when yeah. we do that. And, you know, sometimes uh, I'll speak for my clients, they need guidance and a formal way to understand that relational currency, right? Mm -hmm. Wow. When this happens, this is what happens for that other person. And then I kind of think about, well, hmm, do I want the relationship to continue or not? Right? Like, yeah. okay, then I need to move in these directions. Um, exactly. And, you know, the other piece too is liking who you work with. Um, you know, this, this learning business is really risky. And so you hope that you're with <laughs> someone that you like and you trust yeah. because that relationship is going to bridge the difficulty and the risks mm -hmm. that you need to take as a learner. And that's what you're Absolutely. doing, right? You're teaching new skills. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. That's, that's really, cause I really believe that people don't purposely miscommunicate. It's, yeah. It's like, I Oh, agree. if you have the skill, that you would use it. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, we can maybe be more generous in our judgment sometimes or we're like, well, that didn't go well. <laughs> I can't, you know, just move to, well, they purposely did that to make me feel upset. Um, you know, when I get on some of my Zoom calls now, uh, my clients tend to be quite blunt and direct and don't mm. have a, a really big filter. And so it might be like, what happened to your hair? <laughs> <laughs> to which I'm like, Love it. why? I think it looks great, you know, or what, whatever that is. But, you know, to be able to say to them, well, with me, we're really comfortable and that's okay. And we have a structure for thinking about where I fit in your schema. You might not right. want to start a Zoom call that way though. I'm just saying, you know, it's, uh, yeah. it can really, it can really, <laughs> you know, take people out of the knees. But anyway, Absolutely. so, so Justine, That's let's funny. get to, and let's talk more about your private clients, because I think it's very clear that Napa has their, own, you know, they, they have a specialty and people know what they do and they get, mm -hmm. for you though, who is your in the pocket client? Like, who do you, what do you, who do you love to work with? You know? Right. So I think. I want to reference back to um, the situation where I have a family come in and they're just so disconnected yeah. from their child and that's all they want. They're dying for a connection and it's just like water. They need water and they haven't had it for a month. Well, yeah. I think they'd probably not be living at that <laughs> point, but you know what I mean? They're craving this sense of closeness yeah. with their child. So, and that can be across all ages. Oh yeah. You know, it can be um a toddler that is just not hitting those milestones and is not really understanding that there are other humans to connect with quite yet. So, I I absolutely love doing that early intervention work too. It's really my first love in this field. I started mm -hmm. with early intervention and now having even more training, um, I think it makes me even more um, effective as a clinician having that background mm -hmm. and then now having some more um, training on top of that. Um, so helping parents kind of change and tweak the ways that they interact and play with their child to... Um, elicit more communication, more interaction. Um, I love doing that. And that can be more for a, it could be even with a typically developing child who's just language delayed. It could be with a kiddo who has cerebral palsy and can't use his or her articulators for verbal speech. Mm -hmm. You know, cognitively, they might be brilliant, but they can't get any of their thoughts across because their body is not allowing them to. So finding and experimenting, this is where like the creativity aspect comes in. Yeah. So like experimenting with a ton of different elements of communication to find what works for that child and that family 
it might be a picture system. It might mm-hmm. be um, using switches. Um, and I, I should probably discuss or explain what a switch is. It's basically a um, device where you can, if you hit it or activate it, either it, there's some sort of effect, it's cause and effect, right? So you can start with hitting a switch to activate a toy or turn on a song. And cause and effect is one of those essential pre-linguistic skills. And then later, once the child starts to realize, oh, if I, if I hit this button or if I hit this toggle switch, something's gonna happen, right? Once they understand that, we can start to use the switch in a way to communicate. So for example, you can start giving the child different choices. Do you want to play with bubbles or do you want to listen to music? And this becomes kind of like partner assisted scanning in that you're giving verbal choices or visual choices. And when you hear or see what you want, hit your switch, bubbles, give the wait time. Oh, you didn't hit your switch. No, that's not it. Music hits the switch. Yes, you want music. That's what you wanted, Mm. right? Um, And then once they start to kind of get that, we can kind of move on to more high tech um, communication systems. So, but there's so much out there. And I think I, I do enjoy the challenge of figuring out what works best. And I think through my time in this OGCOM world, I've also realized that um, what I think is best for the child and family isn't necessarily what we should move forward with. Um, Research shows that really digging into the family system and seeing what's important to them, their customs, their background, what's going to work for them because if they're not implementing it and they're not bought in everything all of my work just goes down the drain Mm -hmm. so kind of finding and collaborating with the parents and caregivers of what's going to work best for that family system and then setting them up with it we can always change as we go we can and that's what's so beautiful about augmentative and alternative communication is that as skills change, we can also change the system. We can change the technology to best meet the child's and family's needs. Um, So I love, I I just love figuring out how to give children a voice. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't necessarily need to be verbal speech. Right. Right. So the kids that come in and they're just not able to communicate with their families, with the world around them, how can I set them up with the tools to be able to advocate for themselves, communicate their wants and needs. That's what I like to do. Yeah. And, and yeah. maybe even a family system who's open to creativity, who's open yeah. to trying yes. and experimenting, right? Exactly. Who, you know, exactly. we know that things are not so linear. I think when you get mm-hmm. in, when you get into this field, really it's not very linear. Um, you know, right. you, you want to use logic because that makes sense. But right. so many times I had to go to Z to get to B, right? <laughs> and yes. it's okay. Like, oh, I actually had to yeah. use a different, I had to use like the Roman alphabet to get back to mm-hmm. A, I, whatever that is, it doesn't matter. Um, but it is that creativity. And, and so when there's a family or a client that are willing to go with you, Yes, exactly. That's a huge element that I, I missed. Right? I'm glad you, you caught no. it. Yes. Having, having a family that is on board and ready to take the journey yeah. with me. Yeah. That's my yeah. sweet spot client. Yeah, yeah. It's so fun. It's so fun because um, there's a, a real, there's so much education that comes along from the ferreting and the sleuthing and the trying and the experimenting and staying curious so mm-hmm. much education is is derived from that process versus mm-hmm. okay listen he, here it is okay um research shows that you got to do these five steps in a row and the first step is just hanging yourself upside down by your toes it works <laughs> for everybody just do it you know versus like well i don't have any toes no i don't know whatever okay that's a very <laughs> bad example but 
But, well, what you're saying, it's not a one size fits all. Yeah. It, it just, it's not the same. One thing that works for one family is not going to work for the next. So yeah. Yeah. And I love that yeah. you take into account the, 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 the values and the cultural piece of a family, yes. you know, yes. uh, so many times I'm trying to figure out, is this young adult going to live on their own eventually? Well, I'll tell you, mm -hmm. for many, many cultures, they don't want their kids, their adult children to move out, right? right? And for me to yeah. say, well, well, this is what they need to do. It, it's, that's not mm -hmm. going to work, you know? And, and that's right. not me being very sensitive of the support system that is probably going to support that adult client of mine for a very mm -hmm. long time. Right. That's mm -hmm. not going, that's not really acknowledging the, the, the nuances of their system and, and to make it work for them. So I, I right. love that you do that. So, so Justine, how do people typically um, access your service now? And we'll talk about the private practice aspect versus the Napa, because mm -hmm. I think people can go to Napa and figure you know, that right, out. Right. But yeah. for you specifically, are you specifically private pay right now? Right now, I am private pay. I do provide my families with a super bill and they can submit to their insurance companies and hopefully get um, some reimbursement. Um, potentially down the line, I might look into vendoring with insurance companies, but at this moment, I am private pay. Yeah, I think that's good yeah. to know. And, and because you mm -hmm. are a licensed person, uh, you can mm -hmm. provide super bills for parents to seek reimbursement right. for, you, for your service. That's great. Mm -hmm. Okay, Justine, I always end all of my interviews this way. Are you ready? I love it. I'm ready. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> if you could only choose one skill to empower an individual with, what would it be and why? Well, I think this is just the theme of the whole interview, social communication, 100%. Um, I will go down to like the bare bones of it. Um, just having that eye contact, that back and forth communication, and it doesn't have to be spoken language back and forth. It can be a smile returned by a smile. It can be a vocalization returned by a vocalization, right? Just having that back and forth, that reciprocity in language and communication, that in itself just connects two people, yeah. right? That is the one thing that I would do, just being able to have a those circles of communication between um, child and parent, child and sibling, child and caregiver, right? Yeah. That connection, that bond is more important than anything. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. And it makes life yeah. so much better. Yeah, and it serves as the emotional, it serves as your emotional foundation, mm -hmm. right? It's this idea of being seen, being, uh, being felt that you are understood, right on this yes, very felt sense, you know, yeah. um, is so critical for, for our emotional well-being and our self-concept, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. Oh my gosh, I love it. Okay. So Justine, <laughs> if, if someone wants to reach out to you, how could they do that? So you can email me directly. My email is justine, the SLP at gmail.com. You can also learn more about me on my website, www.justinemuffson.com. I'm also on social media, so you can always visit me on Instagram or my Facebook page. My handle is Justine the SLP. I love sharing all kinds of different informational tidbits about what I do and how you can apply it to your um, everyday life. So go out, go on and follow me, ask me a question, direct message me, or even contact me for a free consult. I'm happy to help. Yeah. Awesome. And I'll include all of those details in the description below. Um, the other thing that you forgot to share is that you also have a YouTube channel. I do have a YouTube channel. It's very new, but I, I'm, I did start a YouTube channel. It's also just being the SLP. I love it because you, in your first video, you show people how to convert their toy with a switch. Um, yes. And the switch that you described <laughs> earlier. And I was like, ah, I wish I had that video 20 years ago because when I was working <laughs> with kids one-on-one, -on -one, 
I would have loved to, I mean, there were so many things I wanted to attach to that. That wasn't me, right? you know, in any way. So, um, so they can check you out there too. I'll put all of that information below. Beautiful. Thank you, Justine. Thank you for spending time with me. Love it. Thanks for having me. It was so fun. Oh, I love that you're in the space. Oh, I love it. Okay. (laughs) Hey, thanks for joining me today. I hope that this interview with Justine helped you understand the vast role that speech and language therapists play. If you got any value from this interview, please hit that like button. Also, if you haven't subscribed, please do. Liking and subscribing to these videos helps to get them to others who may be looking for the same information that you are. It is my intention for this channel to empower through connection, inspiration, and transformation. Until the next time, take good care.